Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. Hi there, glad you can make it. Welcome to episode 74 of our beekeeping podcast. This week we are talking about parasites, Nasima, 3,000 year old beehives and confetti, or counterfeit honey, not count- confetti <laughs> honey. Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. I'm Gary. And I'm Margaret. And, and we are beekeepers from the hills, the Wataki Ranges in West Auckland, New Zealand. Absolutely, and, and, you know, glad you could make it and join us. Our executive producers, which are our patrons um, for this month, are Lauren Hoffman and Aaron Jennings from Jennings Apre. And shout out to them, and, yeah, thank you so much. We interviewed Aaron and Lauren on our last podcast, and you'll find that show on the show notes, or it'll be kiwimana.co.nz slash Jennings. Awesome, and you'll enjoy talking to these people I and mean, listening to them. And, yeah, we had a good talk with them, so it's all good. Yeah, and the show notes for this one are kiwimana.co.nz slash 74. And we really appreciate you coming along today. We know life is busy, and we appreciate that you've taken the time to join us. Our podcast is about beekeeping, gardening, gardening, and a bit of politics about environmental issues which really infect the bees and just so that you know what's happening out in the wider world and also locally and, you know, environmental is always affecting our girls and we also have been known to go off in tangents about other issues. And That's I, right, and there's been some feedback this oh, month. So uh, you'll yeah. Awesome, I'm very pleased about that. Some people like those tangents. Yeah, roll on tangents. <laughs> <laughs> and what's happening at Kiwi Mana? Well, we've got a new fire, which is making yeah, it nice and cr- yeah. warm, and the dog's loving it, snow. And shout out to Lisa, who we met last weekend, and who, she's got her uh, new vaporizer, and she's that's going well, I hope. So. Awesome. Hi, Lisa. She said she listens to the podcast, so we thought we'll embarrass her at the beginning of the show. Of course. Got to start off how you mean to go on. <laughs> and we also, we're trialling out Netflix this month, and we watched a movie called Beyond the Edge, and it's about Sir Edmund Hillary. And Sir Edmund Hillary is one of the most famous beekeepers in New Zealand, and he's also the guy that was the first person to climb Mount Everest. Yeah. And what did he say at the end? He said, we knocked the bastards off. That's the, the bastard, oh, yes. Oh, the bastard. That's right. So that was it's quite a good movie, eh? And there's a bit of beekeeping in it. Yeah, a little touch on what he did. And, and we understand that he attended the Auckland Beekeepers Club here in um, Auckland, New Zealand. So, yeah, a bit of history there. Yeah, and when he was hallucinating up on the up on the top of the mountain because he had, had lack of oxygen, he was actually seeing bees flying in front of his eyes. Oh, yeah, that was really interesting, wasn't it? That you just go back to something that will ground you when you're in a situation like that, and yeah, absolutely, banana, banana. <laughs> and we also went to see the new Minions movie, banana, or, or, or known as Banana in this house. <laughs> Yeah, it was a bit of fun, you know, my grandchildren, Zach and Caleb, yeah, love the Minions, so, um, you know, Alma and Opa love them too, so we went along to see the movie, so, Banana. That's right, it was a great movie. Banana! And we will not play that anymore, and... (laughs) (laughs) We're just a shout out to those guys who made that up, it was just an awesome fun. Yeah, and if you haven't yeah. seen it, go and see it, or click on the link on our show notes, because you, uh, you can purchase your own copy at Amazon. Awesome, awesome, and uh, yeah. And also, I uh, twisted my ankle on the Pallet Bridge of Death, which was uh, an, a, an adventure in itself. Yeah, it was a sort of a sideways slip there. Yes, between our, between our driveway and our front door, we have a pallet, a, 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 a bridge of pallets, which are like a wooden pallets, which you walk on. And we slip, I slipped off and twisted my ankle very badly, so I can hardly walk. Yes, uh, I call them hoppity now, so um, it's very <laughs> fitting. Luckily, uh, it's a bit I, of a slippery, shady character, this one. Yes, luckily I can actually sit, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and less of the hoppity, please. Hoppity hop. 
Okay. And we also talked to Mark Goodwin, Dr. Mark Goodwin, about the yeah. new parasite. Yeah, absolutely. Which we'll go into more detail soon. And what have you been up to, Margaret, besides calling me Hoppity? Hoppity? Um, okay, thanks, Hoppity. Um, okay, <laughs> well, I've been busy, as I always am. Banana! Yeah, banana. <laughs> And loving that anyway. I'm moving along. Yeah, workshop cleanup is going really well. We've got the shop set up now, which is looking really good. And yeah, ongoing building of stock, which is awesome. And our end of winter treatments are on the way. So once they're finished, we'll be preparing for our splits and adding our drone management frames. So uh, yeah, it's all, all happening here. And I do do the splits, but not quite the splits that you know that I did no (laughs) yours was a bit of a sideways slip mine was quite good because my foot went the other the complete opposite way so it was quite interesting it was funny because I was looking out the window and then I heard this noise and then I looked and then all I could see through the piece of the window was Gary just going yeah and so I'm moving along now the other things I've been doing is um Organising a beginner's first season course, which is for students who have attended my courses and they're coming into their first full season in beekeeping. So we've got that coming on and that's only for students that have already attended the courses that I've done. And also the introduction to the world of beekeeping is another course that I've set up. So there's a bit about that in the newsletter and you can have a look at that if you want to book online. That's easy done. And yeah, moving along now to Hiveware and that's all getting done and set up in the apri. So yeah, we feel like we're on top of things. So it's awesome. Awesome. That's great. Awesome banana. <laughs> Let's move on to blog recap. Well, we've been we've been having our winter break, so we we had a brief brief back podcast last couple of weeks ago. We talked about Aaron and Lauren's podcast. Yeah. But the last three popular posts were different types of beehives, which is an old post, and I believe Margaret's got a new updated version, which is going to be really cool. And also, how to split a beehive, not to how to split your leg. That that's, uh, was a great post. And borage. <laughs> Why is it so good for the bees? Yeah, also um, get some of that planted because that is so, so good for the bees. It's quite big and gets quite um, uh, excited when it's in the garden and spreads quite easily. So if you've got a garden that you're worried about, put it in containers and then it should last pretty well. And then once it, it seeds, you can have some seeds for next season. So it's all good. Absolutely. And th- those articles are downloaded about 1,500 times. And over that same period, we had about 7,000 podcast downloads. So come on, podcasters, wow. you're, you're uh Thank you you're so winning. much. Awesome. <laughs> you know, you, you, we put this stuff together and we just don't know how it's going to affect people. But we get comments all the time from people who have been – enjoying them and you know thank you so much for giving us all this positive feedback and uh, without you what would we do nothing that's right just watch banana movies banana so let's I let's, also uh, want to just have a quick say hello to Jean who um, is from Nelson in the South Island she bought one of our Kiwi Mana Kiwi Breeze suits ventilated suits and she said it's it's absolutely awesome it's just so comfortable and big but uh yeah plenty of room in it so she needs to swap it for something a bit smaller so yeah they are roomy yeah they are roomy suits and they're designed that way so yeah it's good to get that feedback thanks Jean, and yeah shout out yeah thanks Jean. should we move on to beekeeping news Kiwimana, beekeeping news. News right here. you can use. On a very cool afternoon on a Thursday afternoon here up on the hill. A very wet and miserable day. With hoppity. Less of the hoppity. Okay, the first story, which is quite dramatic and sad. Yeah, um, absolutely. 
There's a new parasite called Lotmaria pasim has been discovered on the Coromandel in the lower North Island, which is causing devastating losses to be- losses to beekeepers. We actually talked to a beekeeper a couple of weeks back, and they lost a lot of their hives. They, um, the hives are strong and and very, you know lots of bees, like two boxes of bees, and they get they get reduced down to like two or three frames of breathed bees with a queen. Yeah, and so it wasn't uh, it wasn't the first time we'd had um, people ringing us and telling us about hive losses, because some of those calls were through the season, and that really did cause some concern. And they said that they were looking at it, and it's interesting to see you know what they've come up with. So this is very good information for um, our local side of things. Yep, and um, Dr. Mark Goodwin's saying that this is like a CCD symptoms and it's happening in New Zealand, so this is sad news. I think the question is, is is this the start of CCD in New Zealand, eh? I think it is. And we've got a report here from Radio New Zealand, so just we'll play that and we'll discuss it after. Beekeepers want the government to monitor all hives over summer after the discovery of a new parasite. DNA testing revealed last month the new parasite, Lotmaria passum, has found its way into Coromandel hives. Olivia Allison reports. Oksana Borowick has 300 hives at her Coromandel home, but last August noticed a problem. I started noticing that my nucleus colonies, which are like baby hives, were dying. The bees were just disappearing, and over two weeks I lost 100 of them. And then in September, I started noticing that my hives that were, you know, full-on really strong hives, the bees were disappearing. And, you know, what might have had 10 to 20,000 bees had dropped down to 1,000 or 2,000 with the queen. It went on to wipe out 65% of her hives, a cost of $200,000. It was absolutely devastating. And all the beekeepers here, we had, like, we formed a support group because, you know, we lost so many hives and our production just dropped. And, you know, at first we didn't know what was going on. And so, you know, we don't know if Nozima strand and Lotmaria are killing our hives or killing the bees. We don't know that from a scientific perspective. As well as being a beekeeper, Miss Borowick is also a scientist and called in DNA experts to test her hives. What they found was the presence of Lotmaria passim, a parasite that attacks the guts of bees. Peter Dearden is the Director of Genetics at Otago University and an expert on the honeybee. He says it's the first time the parasite has been found here. We could have had it for an, a, a while um, and there's, um, people I think are starting to look into that to see whether they can find it in other places. But um, the problem is it's been found in association with a lot of colony, bee colony losses in the Coromandel and in a few other places. And so it suggests that there might be a link between this parasite and, and the problems of the bees. It's only been found so far in Coromandel, but there are fears it could spread. So how did it get here? We currently, because of the varroa mite problems uh, from a few years ago, we don't have any import of bees into the country, and I'm not aware of anyone bringing in uh, bee products or bee semen, for example, which used to be imported into the country. So it's um, difficult to say how it might have got here. Because we've only really just started testing for it, the one possibility is that it has always been here uh, and that it's just become an issue or because we've tested for it. If you see what I mean, if we're not looking for something, how do we know it's here? Dr Dearden says no one has any clue about how to get rid of it. He's hoping the government will investigate. At the moment, most beehives are shut down and not, not much is happening. But as spring arrives, we really need to have some sort of monitoring to see whether this is a general phenomenon across the country or uh, if there's an outbreak. We need to have MPI supporting us. The Ministry for Primary Industries would not be interviewed and could not provide a statement as their expert was unavailable. For Morning Report, Olivia Allison. Thanks, Olivia. That was awesome. And that was from Radio New Zealand. Yeah, and it's interesting that you're saying the MPI couldn't be interviewed. Yeah, the expert was not there. It's like when I'm not here, you don't record a podcast, eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Banana. So, uh, exactly. So this is very serious. This is a very sad situation. Um, and they, they did say that that um, Lot Maria Passam may have been here quite a while. Um, and Com Vita's come back with a response saying that this this parasite appears to be more hype than a real threat. But uh, we mm. asked Mark Goodwin about that in our discussion with him, and that's... I think he'll eat his words, that guy, won't he, Brett? Brett I think it's interesting, and I hear what he's saying from Convita because we we don't want to get so alarmed, but we also want to say, okay, if this is an issue, let's keep our bees in our local areas until we know for sure so we can avoid, you know, the spread of what this threat is perceived to be until we have a bit more information.
I mean, it's a parasite that attacks the gut of the honeybee. So, you know, in New Zealand here with this issue, we hope that they find some answers. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they're saying it's a combination of that parasite and Nosema serrana. And um, this, when we interviewed Randy Oliver, he was actually saying when they combined Israeli acute polarisis virus and Nosema serrana, they got a similar situation or similar uh, signs of CCD. So this, it could be the combination of the two, eh? But, um, yeah. But we, we, we interviewed Mark Goodwin. He, he was very, very great that he came on the show a couple of days ago where we gave him a yeah, call. Well, Gary gave him a call to get a bit of an update on where he thought things were. So it was really good that he took time to uh, have a chat. So we'll, uh, get Mr. Doc, we'll get Dr. Mark Goodwin on the line now. He's from Plant and Food Research. So here he is. Yeah, what is Lotmaria passum? Lotmaria is a unicell organism that inhabits the gut of honeybees. Okay. And, um, as, as far as we we know very little about it, it's really... We, in the 1960s, it was first described from honeybees in Australia, and everybody has assumed that it had no real health issues. Yeah. But there was a paper that came out from a study in uh, Belgium that indicated that with, with Nassima Serrana, which is a new, new introduction to New Zealand as well, yeah. the two of them together could have negative effects on bees, and they linked it to colony collapse disorder um, in Europe. So, so is it weakening the bees' um, gut, is, it? is that what it's doing? Um, we, we don't really know exactly how it works at the moment, but we but Nasima Serrana is like Nasima apis, which is a they're both again gut parasites that attack the stomach lining yeah. of the bean. And and Nasima apis has been here probably or since bees were brought in. Yeah. Um a, and every bee in the country, um certainly every colony in the country actually has Nasima. And what it does is that it causes ill thrift in the bees and, and will usually shorten their lifespan. And the Thema serrana, which is, has only been recognised as being present in Apis mellifera relatively recently and came into New Zealand in about five years, well, was found in New Zealand about five years ago, has similar but prob- usually more acute effects. Um, yeah. So that in, itself, that in itself is usually a problem. So I guess if, if you if you can prevent the SEMA or, or PALP treat it, that would stop the problem? Uh, yes, that's, that's what we think so. And we're doing trials this, um, this spring to see if we control the SEMA. Do we also control the collapse of colonies that's been occurring? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and no, we've heard some people in, in the Coromandel have lost a lot of hives. So uh, not just quite... there, um, a number of other places in the North Island as well. Yeah, that's, yeah that is it the lower North Island we're hearing from? Sorry? Oh, from the lower North Island? Is that where you've heard yes, some yes, reports from? that's right. Yeah. Yes. And so, what, what, so basically, what, what do you think beekeepers can do to stop it? At the moment, <laughs> yeah. um, we don't... We, as, now, assuming, assuming the, the, this big loss of um, adult bees from colonies is due to Apis serrana and or Lotmeria, yeah. then, there's no, then currently there's nothing, no product registered in New Zealand for... Uh, for treating Nasima, so we don't we don't have anything available. But the the question is, and, and which still has to be answered, and we say we've got a research program at the moment, which hopefully will come up to, to an answer with it, is we don't know whether the, the Nasima is a cause or an effect. Um, for instance, when a colony dies of uh, varroa, if you test if you test the bees, you find viruses, and it's the viruses that kill the colony. But the varroa is the actual cause. And in this case, there may be something that's weak in the bees to make them more susceptible to uh, Nassima serrana and Lotmeria, which then has the effect on the bees so, and, and yeah. the um, colony collapse. So keeping the hives low in varroa mites would also help? Oh, that, yeah, that's always going to help. But um, overseas, they have a treatment called um, fumigellin. Yeah. Um, and a number of trade made and under another um, number of trade names. And in, in a lot of countries like Canada, um, its use is just um, automatic that, that everybody treats um, to keep Nassima under control. But it, 
and it used to be legal in New Zealand up to about 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. But it just, a pure accident, <laughs> it uh, fell off the registration, so it's no longer registered for use on beehives in New Zealand. So, And at the moment, that's the uh, most obvious treatment there is anywhere in the world for uh, um, controlling the SEMA. Yeah. Is it an ant- antibiotic, is it? Yeah, by definition, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've heard some people have had success with tea tree oil. Have you heard of that? I, I haven't heard of people using tea tree oil for that. I haven't seen any data to su- suggest, though, that it's um, likely to have any impact. But yeah. um, any, anything's possible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although this is overseas people, so I'll have to... Yeah, I'm not sure if I've got any data. It just might be anecdotal, so... Yep. Yeah, and... Um, Brett Hewlett from the um, from Comvita said today that it's more, more hype than a real threat. Do you have any comment about that? Uh, no, that's uh, <laughs> if, if I if I was one of the beekeepers. Yeah. Um, I w- w- would uh, they would um, absolutely disagree with that. Y- yeah. I mean, if you come to <laughs> if you come to your apiaries and they've all oh, month before they had fifteen thousand bees in, and you come back and they've all got a queen and a few workers, a couple hundred workers, then you're probably going to take that pretty seriously. Absolutely. And no, we have actually spoken a couple and they have lost a lot of hives, so it's um, quite devastating to them. So I don't know how he, where he comes up with that theory, but... Yes, yeah. and I'm guessing he, he's probably probably not actually looked at any of the hives. Um, no. He's going to, for those, to come to those sorts of conclusions. Yeah, exactly. And so do, do you want people to report it to the, to you or to the department, or how do you want people to get, proceed with this? Um, we we don't have any any actual official reporting mechanisms for for things that are classed as um, endemic diseases, ex- except for AFP, of course. Yeah. Um, EPA um, have got an online reporting system for colony losses. Yeah. I we would like. I guess we would like to hear if anybody's got large numbers of hives that they have. That has collapsed on them, though, and perhaps we could talk it through with them. Yeah, yeah, just to confirm it or deny it, I suppose. And yeah, is it? Well, that, yeah. yeah. And the problem, pro- the problem with just one or two colonies is, is there are so many things that can affect bee colonies. It's very hard for a couple of colonies to attribute, attribute what's the cause of um, loss of bees from them. Yeah. Um, where it's where it's happened over a hundred or so colonies, then it's uh, a little clearer of what the cause or cause is likely to be. Yeah, and I guess the only way to really prove it is to to check the um, gut and the microscope. Is that true? Um, yes, yes, you can, you can, you can um, with a with a microscope, and you can actually see the nesting spores. Yeah. Now, now it's not po- well. It's really not possible to. Tell the difference between the Sema apis and the Sema serrana, though. Yeah, no, yeah. They look, they look very, they look very similar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so, so the best, best thing is for people to get hold of the EPA. Um. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so you can report it on the on the EPA website. Um. The colony losses, or at the moment, there's not there's not really uh, any other kind of recourse because this is. As I say, and as far as advice goes, we're we're just it's only happened quite recently, and we're kind of just le- trying to learn about it to work out what the kind of answer to it is. Um, but that's going to be a little way off yet, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. I will, we'll we'll keep in touch, and we'll um, you report yep. back to everyone what they've found, and I'll include that EPA thing in the thing. Oh, well, thanks a lot for yep. um, giving us an update there, Mark. It's fantastic. Yep, no problem at all. Yep, thanks for calling, eh? Yep, thanks. Bye. Yeah, cheers, Mark. Bye. Wow, that was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. It was good that he uh, came on the show. Yeah, so, um, was, um, got some good points out of that. Yeah, thanks for your time on that. And eight minutes of information there, which is pretty overwhelming because it can affect anybody at this point. And I think one of the things I would say that if the immune system of the bee is undermined, then you're probably looking at what he's saying is that it doesn't help if you've got varroa and varroa can be the cause of the immune system issue and viruses. So I think the, my view is is because it seems to be a bit of a nutritional issue 
that feeding the bees raw sugar is not an option. Feeding bees white sugar syrups are made up from that, but maybe people need to start putting in, you know, herbs and thyme, a whole lot of maybe oh. try the tea tree oil, as you said, and, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, that. that was from the um, fat bee man told me about that. But use tea tree oil, but I don't, I don't know what I don't know what measurements. So you'd have to talk to him about that if you want to find uh, out. Yeah, and I think that maybe because if you are looking at feeding your bees, you you really should be trying to feed them their own honey. But then if the honey itself has got some sort of chemical in it that's undermining the gut, you know you're kind of screwed. But my view is always feed them the best food for them, and that's their own honey. Absolutely. And so the study they're doing is to try and determine if they can control the SEMA, will that, will that help the problem? So, so yeah. I guess that could be the issue. And yeah. They, because there is a product in New Zealand, doesn't it? It's called Epiherb, that they've got same people that do Epilifar have. So and that, that's used for to treat the SEMA. So I wonder if anyone out there has tried that, and what do you think of it? Yeah, it sounds good. It just sounds like it's a... Um it's a herbs, you know. I mean, let's be honest. If you just naturally go and collect a whole lot of stuff, which is like rosemary, thyme, all these things, and use a real natural products, then you should be all right as long as those herbs haven't been sprayed with anything and there's no chemicals in the dirt. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what do bees... Eat. How do they get a good immune system? That's the question I'd ask. Well, that's the other thing I've heard people saying is that because these bees are moved, it's like some of these some of these bees are actually just moved into the area for the manuka, and they're not getting this, they're, this right. They're not getting the variety of pollens and food for them. So maybe that's why they're deficient. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I mean, you look over in CCD in America, the, the you know information we've seen is, is where they are not being able to forage on a lot of diverse food sources and, and you can't tell me that that's a healthy way for a bee to be. That They're supposed to forage. They're supposed to frequent many different flowers to get a good source of food. So, And if they're not, well, you can see why they would lose their energy as such. Absolutely. So if there's any interest in this epi here, we can, we're happy to sell it to people if we can uh, get some feedback from you guys. If you know, if, if anyone's tried it, see what you think. Yeah, well, if you give us some feedback, that'll be good. We we wouldn't look at it as a product at this point until we've had some we've done some it. field yeah. tests ourselves. So we'll keep you posted on that if we move forward on that. Absolutely. And we've had some feedback about this um, parasite issue. Craig Hawkins writes, interesting how bees have found have been around for eons and now they're getting wiped out hand over fist. Makes you wonder who or what is happening. Humans mm. are happening. That's Sounds what's like consp- happening. Think Craig's got a conspiracy theory going there. Yeah, I always support a bit of conspiracy theorism because it, it does make us look at things differently. Absolutely. Thanks for your input, Craig. And Jude writes, I have been around. I have more around now than I did in spring and summer it was so strange. Is she talking about having a lot bees. more bees around? Oh, that's yeah. cool. Um, yeah. Oh, that's good. That is awesome. And Gil Ashmead McCoy says this is scary, and I agree. Yeah, it is. It is scary because we don't know whether it's something that we can prevent spreading. So my suggestion is, is keep your bees in your own backyard until we know a bit more, and try not to um, move bees around too much. And I wonder if MPI are going to do anything. You know, like, they're going to stop people uh, moving bees from the Coromandel or the Waikato area? Yeah, that's interesting, because weren't they doing some studies in Hamilton and trying to get people to keep everything in Hamilton? Oh, that was through Mark Goodwin's. He was trying to make Hamilton AFB free. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that's a different thing, but, yeah, that's awesome. true. yeah. I think there's lots of things going on, guys. Um, so keep your ears to the ground and pop us an email if you hear anything in you, from your neck of the woods. Absolutely. Moving along. Moving along. Why This next story is why this celebrity-backed honey is worth counterfeiting. I thought this, you'd do a bit of a music interlude, you know, moving into that next <laughs> thing. We, no, we don't do music interludes to between the things, it's oh. between the sections. Oh, okay. I'm we, so sorry. You, you, must, you must listen more, but I'll, I'll give you a musical <laughs> interlude. Wait a minute. Just to amuse me. Banana! 
Awesome. <laughs> okay. Everything is awesome. Oh, sorry. I, I tangent. You, tangent. You change movies again. You now, this story is by Bloomberg, which is a big company in America. And it's an article by Bruce Inhorn on Bloomberg. And he say he says 17,000 tonnes of Manuka honey is produced in New Zealand, but 10,000 tonnes has been distributed around the world. So oh, he, that's a classic <laughs> one, isn't it? So he ascertains that there's 83% is counterfeit. And he believes, and this is what they say in the article, most of the counterfeit honey is coming from Chinese distributors. Yeah, that's really interesting reading, isn't it? Because um, <laughs> it does tell you what's going on, doesn't it? It does, and it's uh, just mentioned here, this is the quote, I've got celebrities and foodies love Manuka honey, the so-called superfood from New Zealand, made by bees that pollinate Manuka trees. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? There's a great movie there too. Did you watch the movie? Yeah, it's all good, man. Uh, It's a a nice movie. I I just think, you know, Manuka honey is always so different from, say, a clover or anything. It's it's very rich. And I've heard a few people from the UK comment on the fact they don't particularly like the taste of it. Then they come and, and stay here in New Zealand for a while and they've had it. And then they realise how awesome it is and how full-bodied it is. And they just said, look, I, I do love it. It's different, but I it's very powerful and deep flavours. So yeah, yeah, deep, deep, and aftertaste, wonderful. Yeah, it's true. And we, we heard from Jeff Tucker recently. I mean, he, he bought a he bought a jar of honey. It says Manuka honey, and it had plus ten on it. But I, I just I'm just asking where he got it from. What what's the apiary? Hopefully, it's not counterfeit, Jeff. I hope it's uh, yeah, one I hope of the good it's ones. the real thing from real Kiwis and real Kiwi Nirvana land. And we also had someone asking us, can they can we send them a jar of Manuka honey? And I said, well, we didn't get a lot of honey this year, do we? Not really. So no, we, I mean maybe next spring. We do have honey, but we keep it for the bees, and we just feed them their own honey. Yeah, we had about nine jars of our own. Yep. And a lot of it's not manuka. It's around here. It's carnuka anyway, isn't it? Which is yeah, a which variety is, of manuka honey. Yeah, and it's a very. It's so similar, and they they're still working on those studies with that, saying it's it, got the same. It tastes the same. Health eh? factors. Yeah, absolutely. It just yummy. hasn't got the unique manuka factor. Okay, so we're looking at learning lessons from Convita. This is an article about how how Convita is excellent year on year in results. And Convita in New Zealand, guys, is a company that produces Manuka honey. And over the past decade, they have increased fourfold in its operating profits, almost fivefold. And this is a, this has got some good ideas in this article. It's about how you can increase your business profitability. And I, and I just got to say, maybe it's because you're selling Manuka honey at $100 a kilogram. Yeah, mm. that was one of the... The price is $104 for UMF. That's unique Manuka factor of 20 plus. So uh, if you want to sell your Manuka honey, folks, get it tested and see how much unique Manuka factor you have in your area. Absolutely. And the next story is from our friend in Seattle, Rusty of the Honey Bee Suite. And this is about how the bees pack pollen pellets on their legs. I love this article. It's really good because it really dissects the bee leg. Yeah, and it's got a good photo. Away. It shows you the there's like a rake on their leg and there's a pollen press. And it's quite it's amazing how they actually produce that little pollen pellet. And you, you, as a beekeeper, you would have seen that when they come home. Oh, yeah. And the pollen sacs at the moment, sorry I digress, but the pollen sacs at the moment are just like huge, huge white ones. Sorry. Is that from gorse? I think so. I'm not sure. Yeah, because I've I've noticed they're working the gorse quite heavily at the moment, so it's good. There's some blooming, wonderful pollen out there. Absolutely. Did you like that? Blooming, wonderful. Yeah. So this article about the pollen sack shows you that part of the leg is used to press the pollen. They call it the secret tool. So it's really interesting. They are amazing little insects, aren't they? Interesting to see they have a tibia, like we have a tibia, but a Barsa tarsus. Oh, that's interesting too. Yeah, yeah, have a look at this article, guys. It's quite good. No, it's, um, awesome. it's a pity it's come from a bee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you calling Rusty a bee? No, 
No, I meant oh, the Oh, you mean leg. the you mean the photo? Oh, yeah, the but the leg it, of the bee. It's probably from a dead bee, so you know. No, no bee, no bees were harmed in the making of this rusty article. No, they were already dead. <laughs> exactly, and if you like this, go, and had go the on leg the detached from their body. But anyway, I digress yes, again. Yes, digress. Yeah. And if you like this article, go on to it and leave a comment saying that, Rusty, you should be on the Be- Kiwi Mana Beekeeping Podcast. Oh, yeah. Come on, Rusty. Come and join us. We're, join we're the asked, Kiwi Mana buzz. We've asked her a lot of times. She's always busy dissecting bees. Come on, Rusty. <laughs> Step away from the dissecting bee <laughs> business. Yeah, so we've in this, in this uh, podcast, you've learned about business ideas for beekeeping and how to make lots of profit. You've learnt how the bees do their work with their with their legs pollen and their pellets. pollen pallets. And I like this next one. You're jumping ahead. I know. We had, we had feedback. Is this about Scott? Scott's feedback? Go for it. Scott Scott Matthews, he left some feedback. He says, not only do they pack wax, just they also, no, they also pack wax, not just pollen. He sent a photo of a bee. With a big blob of wax on its pollen, um, pollen thing. So, I don't. I've never seen that to be honest. But there's a photo there. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I thought that the wax just came out of their abdomen. These little ducts there, or something, that the wax comes onto the abdomen that way. But maybe when they're manipulating it, they actually push it onto their pollen sacs to to press it down. To they use, use that, that pollen that, press again. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think that might be what it is. So thanks for that, Scott. And always interested to hear these other things that uh, just teaches us more and more about our wonderful honey bees. Absolutely. And what's the next story? Next story is, um, and look, 3,000-year-old beehives found in Israel. Well, I don't find this really surprising because bees have been around for quite some time. Yes, but, but beekeepers haven't been as around as long as bees, so it's quite yeah, interesting. And look what we're doing in such a short time. I just think, you know, what are we doing? Seriously. Seriously. Absolutely, and did you look at the photos? They look like um, they look like old skips, don't they? Yeah, definitely. They look like they are. I'm surprised that I actually could see, you know, the shape of them, which was interesting because they they do actually look like the old skips, but the old skips are made of rope. Yeah. Oh, I think it, I think what's happened is the clay's gone in them and oh, taken over. Okay. Yeah. So but have a look at um, that article. It's actually really cool. And I right here, a row of old beehives was located in Jerusalem. This is from 2007. And, um, 2007, okay. The article, but it, it, it popped up on our on our radar. And people like it, so we're... Sharing it. We're sharing it. And it's proof that Israel is indeed the land of milk and honey. Oh, I thought that was New Zealand. No, no, that's the the original land of milk and honey from the Bible is Israel. Or Excuse Palestine, as it ignorance. should have been called then, but... And we just, it just proves that an advanced honey industry did exist in the Holy Land at the time of the Bible. And honey was used for medicinal and religious purposes. Hallelujah. And Israel is called the land of the milk and honey. Absolutely. And these hives were located in the middle of a thriving city. See? See, urban beekeeping <laughs> even back then. <laughs> exactly. Backyards, awesome. Urban beekeeping isn't a new thing, guys. It's alive been around and for well at least 3,000 years. Yeah, alive and well in the 21st century. Well, obviously the wealthy owner of this house, he wanted to keep his bees close to him, so that was good. Awesome. I, yeah, have a look at that article. It's just quite fascinating, isn't it? And we got some feedback, too, from Tamara Taylor, and she says... Why am I sitting in an office when there is so much of the world to see? Yes, good point, Tamara. That's right. It's we feel the yeah. same every day. When we're sitting outside in the rain and the cold and, and just trying to get the apri cleaned up, yeah, we're wondering exactly the same. Why aren't I sitting in a... <laughs> Why aren't I sitting in an office? Yeah, with air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and also okay. Sophie, Sophie, is it Biles? Sophia Biles. She said, amazing find. Yeah, well, cheers for that, guys. Thanks, guys, for your feedback. And um, it's nice to hear that, that you guys are, are paying attention and letting us know that you are. So that's all, all great. And these people, where did they 
send their feedback. They leave the feedback on the Facebook. On the Facebook, so yeah. okay. So we, uh, le- we record that and we write it down and we put it on the show notes. Yeah, we're doing, uh, Gary works very hard on sharing as much as he can on our social media side of things. So well done you, Gary. Absolutely. Thank you, Margaret. We've got 2,000 followers now on Facebook. So. Woohoo! How many on Twitter? Uh, just gone over 4,000. Yeah! Woo, woo! Awesome! Okay. And the next article is Wisdom from an Old Beekeeper. Is that you, Margaret? Yeah, I feel old sometimes. <laughs> yeah, especially, no, this is not me. I'll especially read on Varroa. Okay. Yeah. A great story about Ron Hoskins, who has been keeping bees for over 70 years, if you please, and he's in the UK. And the little flip is that Ron has been on the BPKA Executive Committee, trained lots of new beekeepers, and is well known firstly for his conservation efforts breeding the native British black bee, and also for creating a varroa tolerant strain of honey bee. So this is a really lovely article. And um, he talks about British agriculture rapidly mechanised after World War Two, which caused the wild field margins to disappear. Yeah, and this is because the, apparently they had a whole lot of tractors and tanks and stuff, and they they made them into tractors or something after World War Two. So they actually could they could utilise the entire field. So there used to be that that there was a gap like between the hedgerow and the and the crop where they used to not not um, plant out. So that was getting rid of all the wildflowers. Interesting, oh, eh? Yeah, that's very sad because um, I know that in, you know, around 2005, six, there was a lot of talk in the UK to try and get these margins uh, reappearing and encouraging farmers to do that. And they could easily do it without having to maintain it too much. So they can use some wild uh, native grasses, which would just mow like, you know, Necessary, and then all the seeds and plants will just grow up in amongst that. So that's awesome. So I hope they do keep working on that. I know that they tried some of this um, wild field margins in the what was the games, the Olympics? Oh, you mean oh, you mean when they had the opening of the Commonwealth Games? Oh, the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, yes, they yes, did they a lot of had, work on yeah. um, putting planting wild fields and rejuvenating that oh, whole area that's of London. Right, all the wildflowers. Yeah, so and um, they even had bee beehives in the opening game ceremony, didn't they? Awesome, everything. Oh, sorry. Mm. Okay. Anyway, in the biggest drop in beekeeping, this is what Ron says, is was in 1992 when the varroa mites arrived in England, and he spent a lot of time working on preserving the native black bee, which is Apis mellifera mellifera. Double, double, double mellifera. Because oh, I think that's okay. the one. That, I think Phil Chandler's involved in that too, isn't he? I'm not sure if he's involved okay. with the Ron's program, but he's doing his own thing. Yeah, I think that um, the thing he points out about the 1990s when um, Varroas arrived, um, there was a real shift in beekeeping, wasn't there? What a challenge for older beekeepers to deal with this. And even today we get older beekeepers coming back to uh, beekeeping and they just uh, are not aware of the risks that are involved now. So very interesting to um, see their views when they start beekeeping again and the challenges that they face. So, interesting. Yeah, and his final point, he noticed that the fertility of queens collapsed in the black bees in 1993, and he, he attributes this to the miticides used to kill the varroa mites. Yeah, it's a so, good article, guys. You should yeah, have a it's good really look good. at it. And, yeah, any feedback on your thoughts on what he's presented is good, but it's good to get that kind of perspective from over 70 years of beekeeping. Absolutely. He'd be a great guest, wouldn't he? We must ask him okay. if he can come on. And we got some feedback on this um, from Natural Beekeeping in Tasmania. Fascinating. We have a secure British black bee population directly descendant from the original bees brought out during colonisation of Tasmania. Let's hope they help if we ever get the mite here. Treatment free, the way to go. Ooh, ooh. That's right, Natural Beekeeping Tasmania. We must come and visit you one day because we support to... what you're doing and what you're saying. Yeah, just um, that's right. Now, Tasmania looks amazing, eh? Oh, it 
looks pretty exciting. Is that where the devil's from? Yep, Tasmanian Devil. Ooh. And that's for that show we launch on. What's it called? Tasmanian what? <laughs> no. You know, the, the the farmer guy that used to be a, a food reviewer and he moved to Tasmania. Oh, yeah. He was um, he was he was set up by Hugh Fensley. No, no, that's a different, different. Oh, is that a different one? You're talking about the you're talking about River Cottage Australia, which oh, is yeah. isn't in getting Tasmania. confused. There's so much things going on, you know. It, that's no worries. And we also got some new re- feedback from Jane Eels. Is it Eels? Eels, I think. Eels. Such a fascinating read. Great article and well done, Ron Hoskins. Yes. Absolutely, Ron. Thanks Perfect. for doing that and thanks for everything you do. Let's move on to questions from you. Down. Okay, questions from you. First one from Waylon in Texas. Related to Welling Jennings. Okay. Um, How to seal off yes. the beehive entrance? Very good question. Well, they're probably getting into their winter now, aren't they? So. Yeah, there's different methods. Some people just put a couple of bits of water across, but I'm finding that in our location it gets very wet, the wood, and then we're getting all these slaters in, in the hive if they're not properly raised up off the ground. So... Sealing off a beehive entrance, usually do it at night. Don't use a white light when you're out there putting the pieces on the front. You could make a screen similar to the screens that we have, which is also called a robbing screen. I also call it a wasp guard. So you can put something along there. Um, But have have a reason why you want to seal the entrance off. If you're moving it, you might need something different or modify uh, a robbing screen so you can close it off. Yep, and I've seen some people actually put like sponge in it to, when they move them, which is, I've never tried that. That's interesting. I suppose it's a bit like when we do our swarms. We, we have them in the, in the back of the car and we cover them with a sheet. Yes. yes so covering it with a sheet and putting a bungee cord around the hive itself just means if any bees get loose, they're encapsulated. But, um, yeah, the purpose, you know, we really need to know the purpose for why you want to seal off the entrance. Absolutely. And the next question is, when do we treat for varomites? This is from Lindsay in Melbourne. But they don't have varomites, do they? Yet. Well, I think it's good but to she's know. Preparing. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's a really good question, Lindsay. And I would say now, yeah, they're coming into spring, aren't they? Yeah, what we do here at Kiwi Mana is we treat four times a year. We treat once a season, and you know, some people say don't bother, whatever, twice a year. That's what we do. You know, that's our opinion, and we treat once a season. And we use two different treatments. I always think get it finished before you the main activity occurs. So if spring is the breeding season, so you want all your treatments to be completed before that start of the season. So I recommend that you get it done before the 1st of September. And if you're using organic treatments, do it over four weeks. Once a week, over four weeks. Depending on what you're using. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, Gary, and thanks for putting me back on track with that. <laughs> that's yeah, all it right. is. Identify your I treatment. I will always put you on back. As I'm sitting here in pain, I can <laughs> yell at you. Okay, things. hoppity. Um, okay, um, how to get into big Can I just oh. one more question? Okay. Okay, um, oh, you made a really good point, so I think I'd like to just record go this, into that a bit more. Record the is state. that um, identify the product that you have. Do some research on the internet for it. Understand your local conditions because we get European treatments over here which are organic but because of the temperatures here we have to apply it a little differently than you would over in Europe. So always understand the supplier's recommendation way to apply it and check with them. They're the good source to find out about how to apply it. For our treatments, we use the oxalic acid and we use it in a vaporizer. And we do that one once a week over four weeks. And the Epi Life Var, which is a thymol-based 
treatment, we do the same. One wafer per brood box over once a week, over four weeks. Absolutely. And the next question is from Brett in Auckland. That's where we live. Oh, okay, how to get into beekeeping in New Zealand? Well, call us, are, Brett. Yeah, call us, Brett. <laughs> I would say we have got nine eight one zero double nine six five Auckland number. Yes, don't call us yeah. in the middle of the night, people I overseas. Think, I think a good way to go is to go local, find a local bee club or local people like us. Um, who can give you some support and, yeah, have a look around, maybe visit some apries, talk to beekeepers and, yeah, have a bit of a tutu before you um, really leap into it. And we've got some courses that introduction to the world of beekeeping, so that might Coming be of up use. Coming soon, so if you're if you booked early, you can uh, get into that, but I think it's going to sell out pretty quickly. Yeah, we've we've already got a waiting list for that, but um, yeah, you could always come and visit us at the Apri, and we could have a chat, and uh, yeah, or we'll go to the as I said, the local beekeeping clubs because there are a few around Auckland now. There's the Frankton Beekeepers Club, there's the Auckland Beekeepers Club, and there's the Rodney Beekeepers Club. Yep, absolutely. So I'm sure you can find one one there that's good, and. Also, on our resources page on our website, we've got a Beekeeping 101. It's called Seven Steps to Get Into Beekeeping. So that lists a lot of those things we talked about just then. Do you know what? I think that the most interesting thing is that sometimes when you look at beekeeping, it's a bit overwhelming to actually go into a hive. So if you're going to visit a beekeeper, let them be in control and just go and enjoy that. Absolutely. And always bring chocolate biscuits. That article is called Seven Steps of Becoming a Beekeeper, and we'll just quickly read it. These are the seven steps, but these go into a lot more detail. So buy, buy a good book, attend a course that Margaret suggested, get some good bee, get beekeeping supplies, join your local bee club, get some bees, and also find a local mentor. mentor. Yeah, very good advice. Um, I would probably go with the... Talking to a local beekeeper. Okay, and the next question is from Malcolm in Auckland. He wants to know, how can he be the executive producer of the Kiwimana Buzz? Oh, okay, well, you can um, I'll talk to him about go that. into a bit of detail about that. Well, what we do is we have this thing called Patreon, and we have people that um, support us. And what we do, just for a bit of amusement, is the person that supports us the most every month, they become the executive producer. So the answer to that is... If you sponsor us on Patreon, we will, um, and the most, and the one that's what sponsors the most that month becomes the executive producer in the, that show. So that's how you do that, and you can look at Kiwimana Code and Z slash Patreon. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. Yeah, Patreon is the method on how you can do it, and effectively you will be our patron. So we will be, um, yeah. Yep. And now we move on to feedback from you guys. I like this part. Feedback from you. Twitters. I've got the, here. We, we've the got, tweeters on the Twitter. We've almost got 4,000 followers, but we have got 4,000 followers now. Yeah. Yay. Go, Gary. Go, Margaret. Yeah. So, awesome. So if you're on Twitter and you don't follow us, please follow us. It's yeah, Kerry Mana. Follow Buzz. us all the way down to the Apri. Yeah, but it's uh, at Kiwimana Buzz. And we had feedback from Burrow Bees, which I think they're from Middlesbrough. We've been there. Oh, It's near awesome. where my Auntie Jean lives. Okay, let's go for it. First, First listen. <laughs> oh. First listen of your podcast and loved it. Awesome. No worries about being late on your winterizing advice tons of time here thank you well thank you and that's what it's all about we we uh, hope that's the that, value that's yeah we, awesome we, we give it advice even though that people in new zealand might be a bit late for them it's, it's we're we're a worldwide podcast that's right and, and we have had that feedback that it actually while people are in winter there we're talking about what we're up to so they can actually plan ahead which is you know when you're a beekeeper you should always be planning ahead and, and doing your preparation that's so, right yeah what's the next one next one, one is from a cheeky guy from sydney australia called jim wallace and i've talked to jim <laughs> he said love the podcast even though you do have terrible aussie accents 
<laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Jim. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I, th- I would just like to think <laughs> uh, we're, we're down at the Billabong um, listening to Waltzing Matilda. That's it. And the. Um, that song's bizarre. Have you Tasmanian to- Devil just <laughs> ran past and a koala just crawled up me. Um, what does that mean? Wollongong? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But uh, that yeah, Waltz awesome. and Matilda is a strange song if you listen to the lyrics. Just listen next time it's on, guys. But thanks, Jim, for your feedback. It's awesome yeah, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Someone in, in Sydney is listening to us. I yeah, really appreciate so it. Thanks so much. It's it's awesome and we love we love um, our Aussie neighbours. We do. And we're playing here this weekend in the rugby. Yeah, go Kiwis, go all black. I think that's actually at Sydney. Thresh those um, Aussies. <laughs> <laughs> It's at Sydney as well, isn't it? So Sydney. Maybe if Jim, if you're in the audience, hold out a sign saying "I love Kiwi Mana." Yeah, yeah, that's it, Jim. Okay. Or is it Jim? Jim. Oh, Next still, one. Yeah. So awesome. Moving on. <laughs> Ilum, Ilum, is it Ilumin Aperis? I think they're in Colorado. Uh, Ilumin, Ilumin Aperi. They said we really enjoyed your last podcast. You are loved. Oh. oh. Hashtag thank you. We are so grateful. Oh, thanks, thank guys. You so much. We appreciate that. That's from Colorado to New Zealand. Well, sending it right back at you, Colorado. Absolutely. And we got a cool review on iTunes from our great person we know in Wellington. Yes, we know who you are. Mr. Trampeted. Great work, team, he says. Five stars, and I appreciate the energy and effort that you put into the podcast. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Jim and Jill. Yeah, awesome. And We um, appreciate that. We hope to catch up soon. Yep, and we've got an email, too, from Jeff Tucker. Love the podcast. I listened to every episode. Enjoy your topics, sound quality, guests, and the awesome Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone that likes the awesome Margaret bits. Yay! And also, you should go off on a tangent all you want. It makes it real. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You've got one fan out there. Darling. Thank you so much. And yeah, uh, I think, um, yeah, love the feedback. Absolutely awesome. So thanks a lot, Jeff, and really appreciate it. <laughs> and um, now I hope t- I've tangent enough today. Yes, yes. Or we'll, we'll, or we'll set up another podcast called Margaret's Tangents. <laughs> Anyway, let's move on to Patreon. We've had some great new sp- um, sponsors this week, so thanks, great guys. It's fantastic. We had Gavin Weber from the fantastic Greening of Gavin blog and podcast. And he he runs that from, I think it's Melbourne, isn't it? Melbourne, Australia. So I really appreciate it, Gavin. I really appreciate you are out there sp- um, supporting us. We support your, your podcast as well, so your podcast is... Yeah, Fantastic. It's um about creating a sustainable lifestyle in this modern world. So yeah, check them out. Absolutely. If and um, there's a link in the show notes if you awesome. if you like yeah, if you like gardening and you like trying to be, have, make a sustainable life, check out Gavin's they're blog. Of, they're so intertwined, gardening and the food chain and the air and the you know, the land, it's all intertwined. And we beekeepers, you know, really have to understand that. Absolutely. That this natural world is what affects the bees. And just because we have a human perspective on it, we should be really taking note of our bees. It's great. Greening of Gavin blog and podcast. Awesome. I love that podcast. It's funny. And we, we like to get Gavin's wife's on there, and she's really good too. Awesome. She's not on enough, but Gavin, she's not on enough. You must get her on more. Oh, I see. <laughs> she's amusing. Anyway, all he needs now is some bees, and he'll be perfect. Absolutely. What's next, Gary? Big thanks to Graham Amanda and Amanda Bowder. They've also given us a, a monthly donation, so thanks, wow. guys. Wow. Oh, thanks, Graham, and, you know, and Amanda, and awesome, and awesome. We're still enjoying the TV, by the way. Yes. We appreciate Absolutely. that, and we appreciate your <laughs> your monthly donations. And yeah, thanks so much, guys. That's awesome. It just enables us to keep doing our work. You know, it's that's it's right. Great. We're, uh, we we do this by by people like you guys. So, and if you want to check us out, we're on Kiwi uh, no Patreon P A T R E O N slash Kiwi Mana or Patreon dot com. And if you'd like to get our newsletter. We can you can do that. It's Kiwi it's Mana. Free, free. Yep, code. Free weekly. Code. Nz slash sign up. 
We've got like almost, I think oh, it's and did I over say? 1,100 people now, so it's awesome. It's free and it's coming out tonight, Thursday. Coming your way, folks, straight to your home. We're, we're madly rushing in the background writing it. <laughs> Gary's got a lot of work ahead. Hey, hoppity. <laughs> Less of the hoppity. <laughs> I could say you're some kind of slippery fella. <laughs> Well, and the I, puns you know, keep going. Oh, it just never just stops. Keep giving and giving. Anyway, we really appreciate you guys today coming along, and I really thank you for being here. And I, if yeah. you've made it this far, you are the brave souls of the yeah, podcasting world. Great that you made it. So thanks so much, and see ya. See ya. Damn you, Hoppity.